The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, wherever you may be. Um, my name is uh, Martin Barrett, Senior Sales Engineer at Cyber Reason. And today I'm going to, in this session, I'm going to take you through um, what we call an attack simulation um, within Cyber Reason. This is a tool that we have of showing a full life cycle of an attack using very advanced techniques, et cetera. But before I do that, I want to go through a few slides um, just to position um, where hackers are at and what kind of tools and techniques are they using. So I'll start off with an example that we, we've seen recently. Um, then you know, re reflect like the market and, uh, and what companies are using to um, protect against such attacks at the moment, get into the attack simulation itself, and then really step back and then explain how cyber reason would potentially uh, defend against those attacks, and then show a demonstration of the cyber reason uh, tool itself. But before I start, I just wanted to explain a, a short bit of etiquette about today's meeting. So um, everybody is on mute um, from a, a telephone point of view um, on the meeting today, but if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to use the, the there's a question tab um, within the go to webinar control panel. So please feel free to ask any questions there and myself and my colleague Haydar will either answer the questions during the session or run through them at the end of the session, um, wherever we find time. Okay, so let's start off with um, setting the scene. I just wanted to use an example of a particular hack attack that we've seen uh, um, in the past. Okay, so bear with me. So put, set your mind back about two or three years ago, um, where the DNC or the, the Democratic Party National Congress um, in the United States was the victim of a, a pretty large um, attack um, where 57,000 emails were stolen and then placed into WikiLeaks. So th th this is interesting in a few ways because this was very, very damaging to the, the, the DNC party at the time. So around 2015, uh, Hillary Clinton had just um, beaten Bernie Sanders to be the DNC candidate to become president, okay? But just after that, the, these emails were leaked into WikiLeaks and they were very damaging in the respect that it was seen that the DNC was actively um, siding with uh, Hillary Clinton. So outwardly, they were saying it was a, an even contest, but behind the scenes, they were actively siding with uh, Hillary Clinton. So it's shown in, in those emails. Also, there was um, very um, disruptive emails around, uh, for instance, from, from a media point of view, a lot of the media companies were actually, again, um, actively siding with Hillary Clinton by priming her with questions for interviews, et cetera. So all of this really added up into the, the, uh, the national psyche that are asking, really asking the question, you know, can we trust the establishment? Can we trust this person uh, uh, as president? Because she says one thing, but then behind the scenes, the reality is it's something else. So we're still seeing the repercussions of this now. Um, obviously, we're, so uh, th this came out into the open since you might have seen some recent investigations into this, where it was actually seen that it was Russian, two particular Russian nation state uh, campaigners that extracted this information from the DNC. So there was Cozy Bear, um, otherwise known as APT29, and then Fancy Bear, otherwise known as APT28. So nation state attacks um, that actually got into the DNC using a few tools and techniques that I'm gonna show you today as part of an attack simulation. So I thought this would be a good example. You know, everybody's hearing about this in the news, et cetera. So they'll actually dig into the weeds and then see some of the tools and techniques that these nation state attackers were using a couple of years ago, but very much by the nature of IT security, the trickle down effect um, of tools and techniques, what might have been used by nation state two to three years ago is very much coming down into the criminal element um, for hacking organizations, but ultimately script kiddies will start using these tool sets as well. So there's three particular um, ones that I'm gonna concentrate on today and then demonstrate. So first of all, phishing. Everybody thinks you know, that they have a tool that can get rid of phishing a, 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 as a problem by maybe like stripping out the contents of email, et cetera. But there's always emails or messages 
that get through. And this is the case with the DNC. So um, uh, staffers in the DNC were sent emails um, with malicious links in, and that was the staging post for the hackers to further their attack within the organization until ultimately they were able to get hold of the email servers um, and then email contents themselves. While this malware, this is very, very much um, prevalent now. Uh, this has really, really trickled down from, um, from the nation state level um, to the criminal element. So this is in effect, um, another term is living off the land. Um, this is using system-based tools that are native to the OS to actually deliver malicious payloads into memory. So the fact that this is fileless, this obviously evades traditional AV and the likes of sandboxing because there literally is no file to sandbox. So the hackers are increasingly using, using this as a way not only into an organization, but a way to deliver payloads into an organization as well, because they know that organizations might have traditional tool, set, tool sets based around prevention that is easy to bypass using a fileless malware. So PowerShell is an obvious example, but there's things like PS exec, WMI, et cetera. Um, we're seeing that increasingly um, these type of um, attempted attacks within our, uh, within our customers, and we're able to pick those up and stop them. And then finally, our old favorite ransomware. Okay, so we see ransomware nowadays is almost like having um, two elements. So the traditional type of ransomware, as the name suggests, um, attacking an organization being very, very noisy, uh, and then uh, holding the organization to ransom by encrypting information and then asking for the likes of Bitcoin, et cetera. But we've actually seen newer iterations of that, um, which we refer to as a wiper. If you think ransomware, again, is very, very noisy, it's very, very, uh, very intensive for analysts. So say if there's a large outbreak in an organization, say 250 machines, the analysts, when they see those alerts, they kind of drop everything and they have to go and uh, attend to those machines um, to make sure that the ransomware doesn't spread further and maybe re-image those machines, et cetera. But it's actually being used by hackers now as, as a wiper to actually cover their tracks. So if you think the number one uh, problem with ransomware is mass encryption of data. So if a hacker has completed his attack, the idea of like, encrypting a lot of that data is, is manna from heaven to it because this is a way for him to cover his tracks. So encrypt things like the Windows log file, et cetera. Um, so that it, when a company discovers that it's been hacked, they will get boots on the ground IR to find out exactly what happened. They will go through the SIM logs, et cetera, after the attack has happened and actually look forensically to see what happened. Whereas if we're using ransomware as a wiper, we can get rid of a lot of that evidence. Okay, so let's look at how organizations are trying to stop um, hackers at the moment. Uh, it's very much concentrated on prevention. The idea of bigging, uh, building a bigger wall to stop intruders coming in. But the nation state type attacks have seen that have shown us that hackers are getting through 100% of the time. So whether you have a next gen firewall, intrusion prevention, sandboxing, or antivirus perhaps, you know, maybe most of your spend is going on building that bigger wall, hackers are still getting through. And when they finally are, um, they finally do uh, reach their target, uh, and it's found that the, the, the organization has been hacked, the other 20% of spend is on things like incident response and looking through sim logs to find out exactly what happened. But we believe there's a big gap in the middle where you can potentially capture behaviorally what a hacker is doing between day zero and day 99. So there's various analyst uh, reports about how much dwell time a hacker has within an organization before the damage happens. It's, you know, some say 99 days, some say 200 days, but whatever, we, we, we think there's a, there's a gap there where a hacker is doing what we call the non-negotiables until they get to like the, the damage stage. So they might have the initial infection, you know, like logging into, in the, in the case of the DNC, um, John Podesta's email or his machine was um, initially infected via um, spear phishing, okay? But then the ultimate target was to get to the email server. 
So the hackers would have done recon reconnaissance and then they would have had command and control of that machine initially. But looking around in the organization to see, okay, is, is the mail server nearby? So they would have um, used things like privileged escalation to be able to then use tools to then naturally move within the organization. And, you know, a combination of all of those until ultimately where they found the email server. Okay. So we think hackers are um, behaviorally, do, you know, using those tools and techniques. And we think that, that that's an opportunity to capture what the, the malicious things that are happening between day zero and day 99 to capture it every single step and be able to stop that attack from happening in that gap between the big wall and then the IR response when the damage is done. So let's get to the attack simulation itself. So just to explain situationally, I'm targeting an organization where this, we have a CEO, but then we also have an executive assistant, okay? So the hacker in this case, he's done his, um, he's done his due diligence. He might've uh, logged into uh, LinkedIn to see the hierarchy of the business and pick particular uh, victims as we, we call them, who are more likely to, you know, perhaps click on an email link or open up an attachment within an email and uh, enable macros in this case. But it could be other attack vectors, maybe using um, social media with a payload, etc. There's lots of different ways to get into an organization nowadays, obviously. But the initial aim is to get a foothold via the executive assistant, but with the ultimate aim to get to the CEO's machine and get hold of um, sensitive data, perhaps, in some way. Okay, so let me... demo environment. Okay, so this is the uh, the hacker's mission here. So the hacker is using Kali, um, which is used a lot by red teams at the moment um, as a way of penetration penetration testing organizations. Um, and we're using a tool called Metasploit, which is um, obviously widely used. But again, this these tools and techniques are trickling down from nation state down to um, criminal elements, down to script kiddies. It's quite easy to get hold of Kali quite openly on, on, the, on the internet now and use these same tools and techniques that I'm showing today. Then on the other side, we have the nicely named victim. Reconnect here. The, the hacker has sent an email with a payload. This is a very crude example, but there's lots of advanced examples where you, you, you can get very specific, you might social engineer the end user that you're targeting to soften them up in a way. But in this case, it's simply an X spreadsheet with a macro. So user, let's open up the, the spreadsheet and enable the content. But essentially what the hacker's doing at the other end, he has a command on and upon, and then there will be a connection back to this session here. So let's just wait a couple of minutes for this to happen. Um, it's always the case, like however much training you give to end users and however much um, perimeter-based controls you put on, Right. This will use tools and techniques to evade those perimeter-based controls. So we really think in a post-breach mentality at Cyber Reason. So looking for uh, um, you know the, a, a second line of defense, in effect, to uh, to make sure that you're capturing the data of if those perimeter-based controls are breached, we can still capture behaviorally what's going on in the organization. So as the hacker now, I'm going to interact with this session one to basically see. Uh, who's connected in because our law of averages, I would have connected into, or, or I would have um, sent 
phishing emails to multiple users within the organization. So now I want to see the context of that user. So interact with that for themselves. Okay, I've confirmed that it's Robert Assistant. That's, um, that I'm now, I now have a foothold into his machine. I also, from my research, I would have looked at, okay, where is Robert physically located? So I might, you know, make sure that he is um, close to um, the, the CEO in this case, so as part of my research. But initially, no, I'm, I'm a bit concerned as the hacker because I'm fairly noisy at this stage. So as, as I'll get into some more detail when we look at the, the tools and techniques that the hacker has been using, I'm essentially using PowerShell or a piece of fileless malware as part of the payload within that Excel um, spreadsheet to communicate back to the, the Kali session here. So if we look at kind of perimeter-based controls, that might get picked up by a next generation firewall or something that's a bit strange. A PowerShell encrypted session that's going out to the internet, that looks kind of strange. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna use a, um, uh, what's known as process hijacking. So I wanna hide behind the valid process. Because again, this might be, if, if a analyst sees that on the next generation firewall or you know, like some kind of network-based log, they will, the next step they would think, be thinking about, okay, I need to go and look at that machine itself to see what's going on. So if you looked in Task Manager, you would see a PowerShell session. So if I, for instance, if I do PS here, because I have an element of this machine. Processes, so we can see PowerShell um, 2448 two, two, here, okay? But I want to pivot behind something that would validly be connecting out to the internet um, with a persistent session. So if we look here, Firefox is an, uh, an obvious example. So I'm, let's narrow down to Firefox. It might be great to hide behind that. I'm now a shell session to hide behind Firefox. So that by the time the analyst physically went to see the user, maybe used a tool to go and see what's actually running on the endpoint, they would just see a Firefox session here. There would be no PowerShell session. I'm actually hiding within that existing session. So I'm a bit more happy as a hacker now because I'm kind of a bit more under the radar at this point. So next, uh, the next step really is to see, okay, what's nearby? Um, what other machines are, are near me? So as I alluded to before, I would have looked to see, okay, physically, where is Robert in the organization? You know, maybe what floor he's on or, so, you know, you get some of that information from social engineering in some way to find out, you know, wh who's in what room, et cetera. There's various ways of doing that. So I'm gonna use um, a valid Windows tool here to actually do a bit of reconnaissance. Okay, so NetViews, Windows, uh, since work groups, um, quite validly used for network troubleshooting, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I'm not using a particular hacker tool here or anything like that. I'm using a native Windows tool. Um, so straight away, I can see the CEO's machine is nearby. So obviously for the purposes of, of, of demos, <laughs> this is um, very uh, serendipitous that it's nearby, but in real life, a hacker might have to pivot lots of times until they find the machine they're looking for. And the naming convention is obviously quite friendly here as well. Um, so I, I know that my target's nearby. So now I really wanna see a bit more information around Robert's machine itself, because remember I'm logged in as him as an end user at the moment. So I don't have that many privileges. So let's look at the uh, Robert's machine and from an architecture point of view. So I know that it's uh, x64, the exact patch level of the machine. So from that, I can you know, open up my hacker's black book of exploits or use them, the ones that have built into Metasploit Kali already, or I could go into the dark web and spend 20 bucks on an exploit that gives me uh, um, local admin access to this machine. Okay, so in this case, I'm gonna use um, a payload that actually uses a Windows pop-up exploit to get system level access on that machine. So let's background this session. 
start another. So it's actually passed that payload onto the endpoint. So if you notice here, and it's actually injecting code into that session to run the to run the exploit. So the, the, the hack is kind of covering its tracks a bit as well. So rather than just like dumping the payload in the endpoint, it's kind of trying to hide behind an, again another valid process. So just to confirm what user I'm looking at. Uh, so that gives me um, a certain level of privileges now to that system. So I can access kind of system tools. And one of those things is local memory. So I can use certain tools and techniques to potentially get, okay, find out what the local admin account is on this machine. So I'm going to use a PowerShell version of a tool called Mimikatz. To actually read running memory and then capture the local admin account. Because still, a lot of companies have what's known as a golden image. So what that means is um, when a laptop is built, the same local administrator account is put on all of the machines. So this is potentially a line of a um, lateral movement for me to move from uh, Robert's machine to the CEO's machine, because this password might be the same across both machines. Okay. So now I'm going to use another Windows tool to laterally move from um, Robert's machine to, to the CEO's machine. So I'm going to use PS exec, used quite validly by admins all the time for things like maybe um, expedited patching. So patching might normally be done via GPO, et cetera, but with PS exec, you can actually, um, you know, quicken the patching process, i.e. do it immediately via using this tool PS exec, which actually is part of um, sys internals. Um, so part of the windows admin pack. So for us, this would be an, another example of fileless malware or malicious use of um, system tools. What's actually happening is I'm going to laterally move from and then set up another PowerShell based command and control session, ideally from the, um, the CEO's machine. Okay, so shell session here. I'll just exit out of this and just um, which user uh, I'm logged in at. The CEO's machine as administrator. So this is you know this is mission accomplished for the hacker. So I've compressed a. Uh, 90 day hack into what 20 minutes in effect um but the, the hacker no he can do he's he's got um the ability to do whatever he wants in this machine so capturing a pst file maybe capturing personal data about the ceo etc maybe mergers and acquisitions inf information um and also the hacker believes that the, he's evaded detection so there's nothing that makes him believe that okay um something is stopping me at this point okay um, so mission accomplished as far as the hacker is concerned, he can extract data now, but he also wants to cover his tracks. So let's detonate some ransomware. So, you know, as I mentioned before, let's use, um, a wiper, um, will use the, the ransomware as a wiper to cover the tracks. Again, very noisy, um, in the environment. So maybe let's, you know, detonate it on a few machines in the organization so that the analysts you know, um, concentrate all their fire on, on cleaning up um, what they think is ransomware version one um, in their environment. Um, you know, they, they, they don't want a situation where their company is, is brought to a standstill with, with a ransomware outbreak. So that's where they're concentrating their fire. But, you know, the, the problem in this case has just started because un, unbeknownst to them, a hacker has got into their organization and potentially captured um, information off the, um, the CEO's machine.
So this, this is a PowerShell based um, encryption from the, the ransomware. So as far as the hacker is concerned, he's, you know, his mission accomplished and then he's covered his tracks as well. So let's pivot back to just a few presentation slides. And just recap on, on what we saw during the attack. I know that I've condensed, you know, 90 days into a, a very short period of time um, with a lot of command line. But essentially what we saw, the first step, the phishing email. So an Excel file that had active content via a macro, which in effect had, um, as what we'll show in a second, it actually had a PowerShell session for command and control um, back to the hacker. Then we did some code injection to hide behind um, the, 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 the um, Firefox session. So kind of cover our tracks in effect, and then used uh, NetBIOS to actually do some reconnaissance in the environment. Then we actually ran the exploit on the endpoint to escalate from Robert's level to system level. Then we used Mimikatz to capture the data, or sort of the local admin account, seen as credential theft. Then PS exec. To, um, to actually move across laterally. And then finally, we use PowerWare as a wiper to encrypt the machine and cover our tracks. Okay. Base controls and then SIMs, et cetera. How would an analyst respond or how would an analyst be able to pick up this information? So there's been lots of cases recently or hacks recently where, um, let's say the, the target breach, for example, where within the logs of, a, of the SOC, the certain stages of the attack were picked up, but the noise was so great, the false positive noise from the environment was so great that these tools and techniques weren't picked up and certainly not in a timely manner. They were only picked up when the damage had been done. So when boots on the ground IR um, were there, to kind of tidy up the mess. So false positives are a really, really big problem for the SOC. If you're using what we call generation one tools like signature-based antivirus and generation two tools, the likes of SIM and Sandbox, et cetera. So there's lots of alerts that come up and the analyst is kind of unsure whether they're real or not, whether if he researches further or pulls on the piece of the string, is this worth investigating? And it's very, very timely. And so this is why, at Cyber Reason, we wanted to take a different response. So we wanted to have a high fidelity alert. So we really see the whole thing as a data problem. So on the one side, you have um, the problem around the likes of analyst efficiency and an analyst shortage in the market. So it's very hard to hire and retain skilled analysts and keep them busy in an organization um, if you know, there's a lot of manual tasks that they have to do, like sifting through logs, looking for really bad stuff out there. It's, it's very onerous, very manual, and, and quite frankly, quite boring um, for skilled analysts. So they, they might jump ship and go elsewhere where there's a, a more interesting job that's, that's paying quiet. Um, but then on the other side, we have, as I alluded to, we have the false positive problem. So we think that if we can collect enough data from the, from the environment, we can actually sift through the false positive problem. We can actually feed enough information in to look for things like evidence and suspicions. So we start off at the, at the bottom. So we have a, a lightweight sensor on the endpoint, which runs in what's known as user space. So there's no reboot required on the, on the machine. Um, it can be installed in servers very, very quickly because of you know, no reboot required, no change control, et cetera. And that sensor is, you know, it's very lightweight on the endpoint. There's never more than 5% CPU utilization, 10 meg per day traffic. But essentially what that's pulling out is telemetry data. So metadata from the endpoint. So things like what is the process hierarchy? Who's logged into that machine? What sessions are active? What are the registry keys? What are the inbound and outbound connections? And how are they connected back to um, process sessions? for just a few examples. And essentially what we do next is we actually, we feed that into a backend, a graph database that's running in memory, which we built from scratch from the ground up, you know, dedicated to trying to solve the, um, 
cybersecurity data problem. And we feed the information across the entire environment. So it might be multiple tens of thousands of machines and then look for, you know, the low hanging fruit of things like via thread Intel feeds of maybe there's a connection out to a known um, IP that's hosting malware. There's maybe an initial indicator or, you know, we're finding some malware based upon hash because that's past the antivirus, which is signature based. The signature is already out of date, but because we have a live feed to the likes of virus total, et cetera, we can flag that up upon detonation and maybe based upon behavior as well. So just a couple of examples. But then we pass all of this data into our hunting engine in the graph database, and we're looking for anomalies or things that potentially look malicious. And when we do see those, we then filter through a process of evidence and suspicions. So in the same way that if, if um, the police were investigating, um, for instance, a murder scene, their main aim is to get a suspect in front of a judge and jury and convict them. So they're not gonna be able to do that based upon just a murder weapon. They're gonna be look, looking for fingerprints. They're gonna be look, obviously looking for a body. They're gonna be looking for the whereabouts of the suspect at that time, or maybe CCTV um, footage of you know, that, the, the suspect entering the building at a certain time. Also witness type data. So we're doing the same with um, the data or the telemetry data that we're getting from the endpoint. We're building that case, whereas a generation two tool might just be based upon a single rule. So if A and B match, then we'll flag an alert. So for, for instance, like with ransomware, if you see you know, 250 machines um, with ransomware on, as an analyst, that's 250 separate alerts. And that's pretty onerous to go and investigate further. Um, so from an analyst efficiency point of view, that's really, really tough to deal with. Actually, we're, we're getting, you know, getting rid of the false positive problem by getting to the top of the pyramid and what we call a malop alert, so a malicious operation. So when an analyst sees the alert in his inbox or in his ticketing system, or you know, whoever he's alerted by SMS, for example, he would have a high confidence that this is something that needs investigation further. And we, um, and we present them with all of the information that we've collected from a context point of view. So, you know, think of us almost like an auto, a cyber reason as an automated kind of analyst in a box. We're doing a lot of the lifting and shifting manual tasks that an analyst might have done in the past. We're automating for them so that they can make an informed decision when they see that alert pop. So let's uh, pivot back to the demo environment. and just go to another window. So this whole time on both of those machines, so victim 3.1, Robert, and then the CEO's machine, we've had the lightweight sensor installed from CyberReason. So if I refresh now, we've actually picked up a lot of those behaviors that we captured in, in pretty much real time. So the discovery board, as you see here, this is like a real, this is a kind of summarization for the analyst and the SOC to see where is the risk within the business aligned to what's known as a Lockheed Martin kill chain or the non-negotiables I was talking about earlier. So, you know, you can see where the initial infection stage might have happened, where, you know, we've, we've detected privilege escalation, lateral movement, et cetera, and the detonation of ransomware. Okay, so you can see where the risk within the business, so because the further right you go along this dashboard, the more threats of data exfiltration, et cetera, or damage happening within the organization. So this is a kind of a summarization screen um, for the organization. But really the analyst would live in what we call the malloc inbox. So in the same way that an email inbox, this is a way of seeing, okay, what, what's my job? What, what do I need to respond to? Um, and this is a real good way of showing the idea of us as being an analyst in a box. So for instance, if I use the phishing uh, email as an example here, we've categorized these alerts based upon the data that we're pulling in. So no longer does the analyst have to do some manual tasks to find out more around um, what's happening here. We've already summarized that, okay, we've seen what we think is a phishing attack in your organization. Um, it's been using Excel and we've seen malicious use of um, shell. We've also um, shown the machine that's involved and which stage of the attack it is. So if I click further in as the analyst here, 
I straight away, I see all of the information I need. So a summarization, the description of what we think is happening, the machine involved, the user, the root cause, any malicious pro or processes that we see as being malicious. So straight away, I see PowerShell being used. So as a good analyst, I would you know, surmise that this, this file is malware here. And then any inbound or outbound connection that's associated with that process or malicious process. As we scroll down, one of the attack as well. So when, because we're constant, we have a, a persistent session with the endpoint, we're looking um, at, you know, as processes start and stop, et cetera, we can see exactly when we flag this up as being potentially malicious. Okay. And dive deeper at any point. Now for an analyst to create a timeline manually, that's a really, really onerous process that can take hours. You know, going to the DNS logs, going to the firewall logs, going to the endpoint, looking at the Windows logs, maybe application logs, et cetera, to kind of get the same timeline. Also worth noting as well, if, if there was uh, multiple machines that we saw the same behavior happening on, it would be in a single alert. So we would, within the timeline, we would see those multiple machines being involved where we saw that um, the um, being flagged up as being malicious. So in effect, you could work all the way backwards to patient zero. Obviously, you know, um, look at each machine and uh, respond to, to the outbreak, et cetera, but you'd be able to work back to where the initial outbreak happened. So rather than in the example of ransomware, 250 different alerts, we would have this, a single alert with all the machines listed in one place. So perfect from, from an analyst efficiency point of view. Now, let's dig deeper as an analyst. We want to see, okay, what, what's, actually, what's actually the basis of the attack? So we have a few in, um, insights into that. So we have um, the pro things like the process hierarchy, the communication tab here, where we see some more detail about inbound outbound connections, what ports are being used, et cetera, which machines are involved, and the users themselves. So at any point within the screen, we'll always dive a bit deeper to find out more information around what's actually happening at the endpoint. So of, of course, at the top of the screen, we have the summarization, but particular analysts might want to dive a bit deeper. Let's look into this the, the PowerShell process itself. How have we got into uh, you know, popping this malloc? So we, uh, if you think back to the malloc pyramid, evidence and suspicions here, we, we've hit um, kind of like a threshold to actually trigger that alert. So rather than just being based upon one piece of evidence, we're seeing multiple things. So things like shell with an unexpected parent. So the user, uh, Robert, he opened up Outlook. He then opened up Excel, which is normal in itself. But then he um, enabled active content in, in, in that Excel, which in turn spawned PowerShell. So we're seeing that session, okay? We're also seeing obfuscation of the PowerShell command. So PowerShell is a very, very powerful tool within organizations used quite validly by Windows admin for automation of tasks, patching, maybe um, IDM type um, tasks for adding new users, that kind of stuff. But so why would uh, an admin be um, obfuscating the command? Then also uh, the inject, uh, injected PowerShell process. So when we were at the, when the hacker moved to hide behind Firefox, we're picking that up also. But still, the analyst can, you know, a bit look into okay, what is the actual command that's been sent as well? Um, so a, a, a good um, analyst, maybe an L3, would straight away, you know, that um, you could reverse engineer the um, compression to actually see the command. But then also things like uh, it provoke, it invoke expression is, you know, a potentially an attack vector. But ultimately, we're, we're presenting the analysts, what, no matter what level they are, with all of the information that they might have had to manually collect in the past to make an informed decision. So at this stage, you know, it's pretty obvious that there's something malicious happening here. So the analyst can pivot backwards. And his next concern is, OK, I need to stop the bleeding. And we allow that in a couple of ways. So we can, you know, almost like the idea of having a big, big red button, we, we have the isolation functionality. So with this, we can actually enable the analyst to take the machine completely off um, the network, apart from encrypted communications to our back end. 
okay? So they can carry on investigation, but the, the, the hacker no longer ha has any control of that machine anymore, no longer have command and control, um, et cetera. Or we can get more specific on the endpoint by response. Now this session is finished, but um, if the PowerShell session was still running, we would actually be able to um, stop that exact PowerShell command from running or that session from running, get rid of things like uh, registry entries that show persistence. Um, and then, you know, if there was an executable involved, we could, you know, stop that executable from running and, and clean it up as well. Okay, so this obviously has security benefits, but we found a lot of our customers have found a lot of uh, process um, cost savings as well. So, um, for instance, like say we have a multinational um, pharmaceutical company where a lot of their um, end users travel a lot. And if they're say in a remote location, they click on the wrong link and then there's some malware on their endpoint, their process is that then that end user needs to sort out a, cour a courier delivery to send that machine back to the local IT department then have it investigated forensically and then re-imaged and then sent back to the end user. So there's obviously the cost of the courier, you know, wherever that may be, uh, the lack of um, that user not being able to work, essentially, or if they're given a loan laptop, but it, you know, it might not have their normal files, et cetera, or settings. So uh, lack of productivity from the end user. So there's a lot of potential cost savings as well as the security um, benefits of being able to respond centrally um, and get rid of malware outbreaks and you know um, fileless malware outbreaks in an organization. So let's just go to another example that we picked up. So actually, if we use this PowerShell here, this might be a good example of yeah. So we have an existing PowerShell session here. So this is where I was talking about getting very specific and, and, and stopping particular. So rather than um, getting an analyst at the end machine and then re-imaging and getting pretty draconian at that endpoint, we can get scalpel-like and, and then stop particular processes from running. Okay. But let's um, dive a bit deeper into the ransomware example. Okay. So. As part of our sensor on the endpoint, we have the ability to um, detect ransomware in a few ways. So we introduce in the endpoint um, what we call canary files. So again, if you think that the, the main behavior of ransomware is mass encryption of data in a Windows session. So we expect, if, nowadays if we, if we see encryption on a laptop, it's generally at boot time, it's at the boot level. So nothing to do with the Windows session itself. So the, if we see encryption at the, um, the Windows session level, unless you're a developer of some sort, um, or, you know, like, or you're a media company that's trying to encrypt large files, that's fairly unusual. So the, in effect, the um, canary files are looking for processes that are trying to encrypt um, data quickly. So the, the, in, uh, like the namesake, you know, a canary in a coal mine looking for gas, we're looking for processes that are trying to encrypt. So we, we'll go at the top of a file and then at the bottom of the file. So maybe, you know, start the um, canary file, name it with AAA, uh, and then, but then, you know, at the bottom, maybe name it with, with numbers, for example, because different ransomware start at either the top or the bottom of a file structure and try and encrypt. So with that, we, we actually give the, the canary for that they're an indicator for us and we can actually stop that process from happening. So we see here in the center here, we see no files affected, okay? So the ransomware has actually detonated, but the damage hasn't been done. So we can actually work backwards in our tool as well and, and get rid of other indicators of the ransomware or the files that are associated with the ransomware. But our initial concern is making sure the files are not encrypted. We also have other controls like um, looking at the MBR record uh, and then also looking for things like shadow copy deletion as indicators for us that um, ransomware um, has been detected. Uh, and you may also have heard that we, um, we have a free version uh, of ransomware detection called Ransom Free, um, which I think we're up to a couple of million of users, a couple of a million users. So it uses the same kind of functionality but in an enterprise context, we're collecting that information and showing that within the malloc screen. Okay. So I just want to check if there's any questions so far very quickly. 
I think we're good so far. Okay, so I'll just carry on. So I'm mindful of time. So I just wanted to wrap up with, um, so think of the, the, the malloc as almost like the, the automated hunter that you have within your organization. Um, that's you know got your back, it's looking for um, malicious behaviors in your organization and then summarizing that for you for your analysts to be efficient and you know potentially upskilling them. But the power of the graph database also gives you the ability to proactively hunt within the environment. So I'll just I'll pivot to another environment that we have here from a demo perspective that um, that shows you that the, the power here. So the way that a graph database is constructed is you um, the the connections between data is already there. So if you think of a relational database, you might need to put in things like join tables, etc., to make sense of that data. So this is why. Up until now, nobody's really approached cybersecurity um, from uh, as a data problem because the construction of flat databases it makes that very, very onerous and very, very hard to do. Where a graph database um, has those connections out of the box. So ex recent ex examples of great, uh, graph databases have been, um, say, the Panama Papers, um, where a law firm in, in Panama was hacked and um, lots of its clients were put into the public domain. Um, they, they were basically being using this law firm to hide um, tax evasion. And they were using various kind of shell companies, et cetera, to cover their tracks to ultimately who owned those companies. And the investigators found that the only way that they could you know, put this patchwork of information together was by putting the data into a graph database. So that was, you know, seemingly unsimilar connections were in place um, so maybe addresses, et cetera, um, but they were ultimately able to extract or you know, get all the way back to the ultimate owner of that information. So in the same way we're you know, collecting the information from the endpoints um, from a malloc point of view, but then we can also make the analyst proactive as well. So for example, I'm going to look within my organization to see, okay, who's maybe using peer-to-peer -peer in my organization or who's using Tor as a data set. So I want to, you know, first of all, see which machine is doing that, which processes might be running, or you know, initiating those connections, and then where is it connected to? So my input is, I, as one of my thread intel feeds, I know which servers um, are, are on the internet and, and running as Tor nodes. So I click get results here. Yeah, it comes back pretty quick because we're running the graph database in, in physical memory. So across a large environment, we want to be able to you know, query that data very quickly. So straight away, I can see a few connections here. But I also want to see, OK, well, what is the traffic that's passing between myself and those nodes? OK, so I can see bits and bytes. Then I can see which processes are initiating that connection. And then finally, deriving that back to particular machines. Okay, so you know this is not only a cybersecurity tool, but potentially an IT hygiene tool as well. It just shows the amount of data they were collecting. Important to note here as well that within one UI, we're capturing information from multiple sensor types, so various flavors of Windows. So we go all the way back to XP Service Pack three. Um, there's OS X, so we're about you know five or six versions of OS X back that we go, and then um, lots of different flavors of Linux. Linux and Unix um, that we collect from as well. So from an analyst point of view, this is kind of your single dashboard across the entire environment, um, no matter how large. Our largest implementation is 660,000 endpoints. Bear that in mind. Um, okay. Martin, so, thanks for your time. We're, Martin, um, we have a few questions from the audience. Um, I see okay. you. Um, so please take a look and see if we can answer all of them or just a few of them. We have 10 minutes left. Sure. Okay. I did. I looked. Um, I looked in the questions tab, and they weren't there. Maybe it was in the messages. Okay. Uh, try Let to me open. just see. Hold on a second. Okay. I have a question here regarding the live feed mentioned on hashes. How would it work in an environment without reliable internet connectivity or even no internet whatsoever? E.g., field laptops that can stay offline for weeks sometimes. Do you have a local database with latest details? Also, how big would be the downloads of those live, um, also in the context of developing countries without reliable connections? 
Um, so yeah, and, and let me answer that in a couple of ways. So yeah, we're aware that machines might be offline uh, for some time. So we can actually cache the telemetry data that we have locally um, before it's, it's actually put into the graph database. Now, in regards to the, the live kind of thread intel feeds, we're dependent on collecting that centrally. So there are, you know, some preventative measures that we can put on, on the sensor. So today's session has really been around, uh, primarily around the EDR side of things, but we also um, have PowerShell uh, prevention that we can push down to the endpoint, um, antivirus um, signature base to get rid of a lot of the noise, and then NGAV as well. So we do have some preventative tools, but we didn't demonstrate that today. Um, and then finally on that question, we, we do have a lot of customers in emerging markets situations, primarily Africa, where yeah, connections are bad and you might have remote outstations, et cetera. Um, so from a data point of view, that it's, it's never more than 10 meg per day that we have from each sensor. Um, and it's also worth bearing in mind that that's a trickle during the day. So it won't be in one big data grab. We're actually doing it almost like a delta, looking for delta changes. So as a process starts and stops, or as a registry entry is deleted or entered, that will be a new piece of data via the persistent session. So even on very, very limited um, connections, we can capture that data, okay? So moving on to the next question. Uh, where does the malloc sit in the network? Um, if there's a ransom attack, would the malloc be affected. Um, so the, the malloc is actually the back end alert that we're capturing from the data. So I'm kind of taking from that question that uh, more along the lines of the sensor. Um, please, you know, um, reword the question. I got it the wrong way, but the sensor is on the endpoint. It runs in user space, um, but we actually have some protections around that sensor. Um, so things like a watchdog um, service. Also, we can have a local password against that installation so it's not removed. Uh, a protection point of view. And we've had the sensor penetration tested quite a, a few times by customers um, to make sure that you know the hacker can't circumvent. Okay. Um, okay, other questions? Bear with me. What kind of mechanism do you use to intercept the ransomware before it reaches the good files? Um, so yeah, this is getting back to the canary files. So that you know, we we look at the behaviors of ransomware that we've seen before, and we have analysts that are constantly looking at that. You might have seen Amit Serpa on CNN a few times around bad rabbits and not petcher. Um, they're constantly looking for new behaviors of ransomware. So with the canary files, we would actually um, we can select which files and folders that are mission critical and put those canary files in those folders at the top and the bottom looking for that encryption happening. Uh, next question, bear with me. How extensive are the remediation options available to a user? Can you give some examples of the types of remediation actions available possible, please? So I think, uh, Shim, that was posed um, before uh, I went through into the, into the malop. Um, so if we go back here, Oops. By the remediate here, the respond, we have the functionality here to stop. And we are actually looking into, you know, maybe um, some kind of um, control on the endpoint as well to run tools, et cetera, um, as a potential roadmap item on top of that. Okay. Uh, what kind of mechanism do you use to intercept the ransomware before? Okay, that's. Okay. That same question again. Um, is this easy deployable for small businesses who are mostly cloud-based? Absolutely. So let me just pivot um, a second here and go into where the install files are here. So um, say, for instance, Windows is MSI-based. Um, so you can use SCCM or you can use wh whatever tool you use within the organization um, to roll that out. So we have. Uh, Last week, we had an installation of 100,000 within the space of a day. Um, so, you know, that's for large organizations. For, so for small, much smaller organizations, even if you wanted to, you know, install an MSI via command line, et cetera, or an endpoint, 
it's very, very easy to set up. We just need to know maybe, you know, do you have a proxy in place or a firewall where you might need to open up 443, for example, because a probe or sensor connects over 443 to our cloud backend. So normally we um, our backend, the graph database is running in the cloud, but we have an on-premise option of that as well. But most of our customers use um, the cloud instance. Um, so very, you know, very, very simple to set up, install, no reboot required. And as long as we have that network connectivity to the back end, you can roll it very, very quickly. I think that's all the questions I had, uh, Ada. One last question. Let's see if we have time for it. Oh, that's a long one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some antivirus solutions are aggregating different features such as application whitelisting and automated update patching of non-OS software, Java Flash, etc. Are those included in the different options you mentioned on prevention within Cyber Reason? Um, so I'll just, uh, there's another bit to the question, so I'll just answer that first. So we're not actually looking into the application itself in, in that respect. We're looking at things like the process and then the behaviors. So one of um, the example given in the question was things like Java, Flash, et cetera. So when um, the likes of Flash um, or you know, there's Java exploits out there, behaviorally, we can pick that up. OK, so it might be you know, the uh, file is detonated against like an unpatched version of Flash or whatever. But behaviorally, there's things that happen afterwards. So there might be outbound connections to, you know, maybe a, a blacklisted IP or an unknown IP. Or well, there's tools and techniques that happen after that. So we're not looking like pre-patch. We're kind of looking after the exploit has happened behaviorally and trying to capture at that point. Okay. We can also, if we see certain processes as being malicious, we can actually whitelist those or blacklist those on the endpoint. So to say, okay, if this, we, we don't want to see this run on the endpoint. We can also behaviorally whitelist as well. So if we see this type of behavior in this, in combination, in this environment, that's actually quite valid for this organization. So it might, out of the, out of the box, you know, trigger a suspicion, but as an analyst, we can trigger um, behavioral whitelisting. Okay. So the second um, part of the question, can an organization have, for example, an antivirus solution, e.g. McAfee, running in parallel performing, performing those tasks while cyber reason will be doing the monitoring and analysis of suspicious behavior bits to identify issues? Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a very um, common example that we have in customers where they use an existing tool for antivirus, signature-based, and then maybe our EDR tool um, as a second line of defense. Or we have some customers that are using that third party signature based antivirus, but then our NGAV functionality. So if you think signature based antivirus is looking for files as they land on the endpoint, so um, scheduled kind of scans, NGAV is kind of sitting above that upon execution. And based upon machine learning, we're looking to see if there's particular um, touch points within that binary as before it um, detonates that might you know, have malicious indicators. So we're taking in, um, into a machine learning engine, constant feeds from the likes of virus total to look for new iterations of malware and then pushing that to the lightweight sensor to look um, upon detonation. And then we have you know, ransomware as in, you know, another line of defense, PowerShell protection, i.e. blocking PowerShell. So allowing good, but blocking bad. And then the EDR as the kind of the back we're capturing everything in the environment in the endpoint. So you always have that visibility. And then there was, sorry, there's a very last bit to that question. Uh, is there an MSP partner version centrally managed for many different companies? So we're actually working on that at the moment. Um, so um, each implementation, whether it's on the cloud or on premise is dedicated to that one customer. But the thing is, so um, within AWS, it's OVA based. So we do have, uh, we can provide MSSP in effect, but um, it's not, you know, you don't have any kind of uh, multi-tenancy or anything like that, but we are looking at that as, a, as an option coming up. Okay, I think that was the last question. Oh, can this be implemented uh, for a gold image? Yeah, absolutely. So on the endpoint, you can, uh, as a normal MSI, 
you can have that as a, as a build. And then um, also from a VDI perspective, we have a lot of customers that have that as part of their gold image as well. I think that's all the questions, Hayda, and thanks everybody for their time today. Bye everyone, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Martin. Pleasure.